So thanks for coming by, fellas. And today we are going to uh, introduce a new exploitation, I mean a new technique by attacking Windows by Windows. And my name is Li Zhou and uh, this is my colleague Ying Liang. Hi everybody. Okay, we are both from the Tencent PC Manager. So this is an outline of today's presentation. First of all, we are going to introduce about this ourselves, our teams, and then we are going to uh, have a brief view of the old school styles to exploit the Windows kernel. And then we are going to talk about the uh, Windows 10 limitations. And I'm going to introduce the 0 to 1 exploitation and my colleague in he will introduce the 1 to 0 exploitation. Okay, so first of all, in will introduce the team. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Kelly Black and I'm one of the members in Tencent Setup. First, I'll take a short time to introduce our team. Uh, we have uh, seven members. Xin is our team leader. Uh, God says I'm analyzing uh, flash and uh, PDF memory allocation. Kaya is me and I'm responsible for finding Windows color vulnerability and uh, writing exploit. Michael is exporting PDFs. Kevin and Vea are doing fast jobs. Rodma is doing AI com uh, combination uh, to vulnerability expectation. In part 1, 2016, we got the system privileged by hacking Adobe Flash in only three seconds and uh, won the tight mask of Palm by achieving the highest score with King Team. Uh, also, we got the system privilege and uh, achieved the prize uh, in Jig Palm by hacking Swiss Pro 4 in only <coughs> one second. In 2016, we received uh, 46 acknowledgments from Microsoft and uh, Adobe. Today, we will show the techniques of Windows Color Export when we use the import and uh, Geek Power. Should we start? Okay, uh, so I'm going to introduce the first 0 to 1. So basically, uh, if we want to exploit or if we want to attack the programs in user space or the programs in the kernel space, we have to deal with three problems, right? So the first one is where to write, the second one is what to write, and the third one is what can we do right now? So for the first question, I think everybody knows that we should uh, interrupt the normal uh, procedure of the process and force it to jump into our shell code. And then what to write, actually we want to uh, you make use of the abnormality and make use of them. And the third one is after we alter the data, what can we do to reach the final destination, like escalate uh, the privileges to the system privilege and or gain whatever we want. So uh, in the old days, if we want to attack Windows XP or Windows 7, so these three, three questions are quite simple. So we need to focus on a structure that is called how dispatch table. We can call a API function that is anti-query system information to get the loading addresses of all the kernel modules uh, and uh, we add some offset and we can finally re uh, get, get the how dispatch table. So this how dispatch table is a kind of a function distributor. Uh, there's a lot of function starting address in this how dispatch table. So what we need to do right now is to replace one or many of them, many of the starting address with our shellcode address in the user space. So then when we call the function anti-query interval profile, which has a kernel version of the uh, anti-query inter internal profile, and uh, the kernel version will find the address of the Start starting address of in the how dispatch table, which now is our shell code address in the user space and execute the our shell code. So it is very easy for old school days. Uh, but I think the, uh, the Microsoft uh, security engineers are quite, they are quite smart, right? So they create two, uh, several of the protections to forbidden these actions. So I think there are two most effective ways. So the first one is the integrity verification and the second one is SMEP. So for the integrity verification, the system will, uh, we both know the process has, uh, has many attributes. So the integrity is one of its attributes. Uh, so, so, so the windows will check whether the process is a high integrity user or a low integrity user. If it is, a, it is a low integrity user, when we call the function 
anti-query system information to get the loading base address of the kernel modules, then what we have right now is only a access status access denied. So uh some of the hacking teams they create some ways to do uh, to you know to bypass it because they found some of the information leaking vulnerabilities. So this information leaking vulnerabilities will give us the information about the loading address but uh you know this is uh, another vulnerability so we have we have to use two vulnerability to you know to gain our final uh, to reach our final destination. Uh, the other protection is called SMEP which refers to the uh, supervisor mode execution protection. So basically uh the this protection will forbidden the CPU or the system to execute the code in the user space. So what if we if we if we just run the code uh if we just uh, do like the old school days we replace the shell code address to the uh, to the address in the health dispatch table and execute it then what we have right now is a blue screen right there. We got nothing from it, from it. So some of the hacking teams are very smart so they came up with the ideas of the ROP chain. I think everyone knows it. ROP chain. They use the ROP chains to remove the SMEP protection. But in order to do so they first they, they also need a uh information leaking vulnerability to get the loading base address of the Win 32K driver and then uh, use the ROP chain to close to close the protection. So basically we need two vulnerabilities. We need the ROP chain and we both know creating or constructing this kind of ROP chain is very difficult or very annoyed. So everybody is upset. So this is going to be our new exploit <coughs> method. So our method has many advantages. We can use it on all Windows operating system no matter it is x86 or x64. We only need to trigger one time. We can bypass SMEP. We do not have to create any of the ROP chain. We just only change one bit in the kernel space and we can bypass the KALSR. And now I'm going to introduce the details of it. So back to the three questions. Where to write? Uh since Microsoft does not allow us to use the NT query system information to get the loading address, uh but there's something that they did not, you know, they did not find. So this is a G shared info structure. Actually you can see uh the G shared info structure has a kernel map is in the kernel space. But if you loading the user 32.dll the dynamic uh, dynamic link library, so this kind of memory will be mapped into our user space automatically by the function mm uh, view of section mm map view of section by that function. So basically, the the data in the G shared info are mapped into the user space. So this is a kind of information leaking. Uh, vulnerability but uh, Microsoft did not regard it as a uh, vulnerability. Maybe they were fixed in Windows 11, Windows 12, I don't know. So as you can see the P hat uh the P hat the P hat is a is a member of the hand handle entries handle entry. So this P hat will point to a window object. Also it can point to a a menu object. So I'm going to focus on the window object. So basically what we need to write is in the window object. So what's in the window object? There's a very very important structure that is called tag window object. So window is a basic, I think it's a basic object in Windows. We always use create window API to create a window and then uh, in the kernel, uh, the kernel will create a tag window structure. So in this tag window structure it has many important information like the uh the, the parent window, like the uh window process, like the name of the window, uh like the window extra data. So what should we do right now? I think we should focus on the windows extra data. 
let's look at the structure of the ta tag window. So you can see there's a member called CB window extra. What is CB and window extra? CB window extra is actually the size of the window extra data section. As you can see at the bottom of this structure. So uh, we could use two APIs to control the tag window structure. The first API is set window long and uh, the second one is get window long. As, but there's two params that uh, it's, it's strange. It's an index. What is an index? Uh, actually, we can regard the window extra data section as an array, as a word array. So basically, the an index is an index in the window extra data. So what we need to do, what we could do right now is to use set window long to uh, write something in the window extra data. And we, we can also use get window long to read a D word in the window extra data by using the an index param. So, so this is a case that, uh, this is a normal case. So, so we can see that, uh, we have two windows, the window one and the window two, and between them there are other objects. So in window one, uh, we have the CB window extra. The value is uh, hex eight. As we can see, the this is a binary formation of the uh, CB window extra. Uh, in the position three, there is a, there is a one, and uh, the others are both zeros. So what if we change we change the higher speed to one? What if we do so? Yes. We just change the window extra size from a very tiny size to a very huge size. So in our case, the, no, uh, the original size is eight, right? And now we change it to two gigabytes. So as you can see right there. So basically, the data just behind, just uh, right behind the tag window of window one becomes our extra data. So we could use the set window long to modify the data, right? To modify the data, just uh, regard this, this stuff as our data. So we can use that API to change it. What, what we can change whatever we want. We can change uh, the data into the, our, you know, future, uh, for our future exploitation. So how can we read from the kernel space? Okay, since now we have changed the, the uh, window extra data size from eight bytes to two gigabytes. So that means uh, the window two is probably by, uh, by modified to the extra data of window one. So now uh, let's focus on a member that is called string name. String name has three members, the length, the maximum length and buffer. So this buffer actually contains the character of the window two. But now we can change the data in the window too, right? So basically we can set the buffer to the place we want to read. And then we call internal get window text to read whatever we want in the kernel space. Is that amazing? So the same, we can also write something to somewhere by using the uh, API NT user def set text. What we need to do right now is to set the buffer to the place we want to write and then we uh, call this API function and uh, you know our data are written to the position we assigned. So basically we can call the uh, set window long for many times, we can reset the buffer address for many times and we can you know read and write anywhere we want. Okay, so now how to ex escalate our privilege from the normal user to the system user? Basically, uh, we just reverse engineer, uh, we just do reverse engineering of the get window thread process ID and we found a relationship between the tag window structure and the E process at the right, the E process structure. So as you can see, uh, in, the uh, in the tag window structure, there's a member called PTI, the PTI points to a tag thread info structure and tag thread info structure point to the k thread structure and uh, at the offset 220 
in K strand structure, it points to, there's a member called process and it points to the uh, E process structure. And in the E process structure, there's R token. There's R token of R process. But the windows help us. Why? Because if we do not set our parent window to our window, windows will force the desktop window as our parent window. So basically we can use the sprung parent in our tag window to find the desktop window. And through the same procedure we can finally reach the csrss.exe, the system process. And at the same offset we can get the system token. What we need to do right now is to use these two API, use these two API, set window and get window to read the token from the system token. And then we write it to our token position. So this is going to be our uh, escalation process. So this is a real case, the uh, CVE 2016 -0174. At first we load a font into the kernel and the kernel will create a PFF object. And then we free the PFF object. But actually in the kernel somewhere stores the reference of the PFF object. And then we immediately reallocate the same size of the memory and we, you know, this is a definitely a use after free, right? And then we free the font again and uh, finally reach the step, uh, reach the step five. Step five is a assembly code. Yeah, it's right there. So RAX, the register RAX is actually controlled by us. We can let the RAX point to the uh, at the tag window, at the, the offset DF at the tag window, and then plus zero, uh, hex C, plus hex C, and uh, we will reach at the highest bit of the CB window extra. And now, what we need to do now is to execute the assembly, co assembly code that is OR, DWAR, PTR, RAX, and plus hex C and 2. And we can change the size of the CB window extra to from zero to two six zeros. So in the part two, we are attacking the flash and uh, we are using uh, the flash to execute any word in the edge, Windows Edge, and uh, we escalate the edges process, uh, the privilege of the edge process to the system process uh, privilege, and uh, then we escaped from the sandbox. Uh, we complete this word uh, in, oh, we complete this job in three seconds and uh, we won the 50,000 reward and uh, Surface Pro 4. So in other case, there are two assembly code right there. Uh, yes, you as you can see right there. Basically, what we need to do right now is to make the CB window extra as large as possible so that we can control all the data just right behind it. So if you do, if you get it and you will make a success. So in summation, where to write? We need to write the CB window extra. So what to write? Actually, we just change one bit of the CB window extra and make it, make it a, a very large size. So what can we do right now? After we did that stuff, we can read from anywhere, we can write any value to anywhere, and we can still the token of the system pro process to our process. That is a whole procedure of our exploitation from zero to one. Okay, so now and uh, my colleague Ian will introduce another technique which refers to one to zero. Uh, how do you explore Windows Color by a tiny bit from uh, zero to one? The previous presentation gave us the answer. Now we have a new question. If we can modify a bit from uh, one to zero, how can we do the same job? Uh, let's have a brief view of the function. NT GDR get font Unicode ranges. This function calls five other ones and uh, return. At first, it calls GRE get font Unicode ranges. The first program HDC is the hand of our device context. Our font has been selected into the device context before. If we set the second prime to be nine, we will get the range size of the font only. Then the size is sent to 
allocate free temporal buffer, and uh, we will get a temporal memory buffer. We call GIE gate function equal ranges again, set the param to the memory buffer, so that the range data would be written to it. We deliver the data from color to user space and uh, free the temporal buffer. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, five steps. It seems to be uh, very simple. However, in system security, um, simple sometimes means look, there is maybe a vulnerability. Let's consider a situation. We have two kinds of font. One got small ranges. Suppose its size is one. The other got large ranges. Suppose its size is ten. And uh, we have two threads: thread A and thread B. They are both doing infinite loop. So the A calls NT GDI get font equal ranges, execute the five steps. So the B do the same, uh, do the selection job. It will select small and uh, large font. We may have a process like this. So the B select the small ranges font into DC. So the A calls GIE get font equal ranges for a function and uh, get the small size one. Then it allocates a memory buffer, which is only one byte. Then thread B selects the large ranges font into DC. Thread A will, uh, thread A call GIE get font equal ranges again with the one byte buffer. Now thread A will face the large range font. So 10 byte range data is going to be written to one byte buffer. What will happen? We will get our overflow. So this is the CVE 2016-3355. The whole process will randomly happen when, uh, with uh, one second uh, when I test on my computer. Uh, my exploit procedure is like I said before. I create two font and uh, not them into the system at first. Then I notched two threads and uh, let them do racing condition. After overflow happens, I could control the R15 register. Then with the help of this awesome code and the R15 register, I can modify one bit of anywhere, change it from one to zero, just like here, uh, position two. Now we have the overflow and the R15, but how could we exploit? What about uh, CB extra as we mentioned before? We could turn four to zero or hex 14 to hex 10, but it seems to be useless because we still cannot modify the next tag window structure. What about the flag? There is a lot of flags in tag window structure. We can turn some of the flag bit from uh, one to zero, but I didn't find any appropriate, any appreciate uh, exploit. Let's record the share info. In handle entry structure, the offset hex uh, 10 is B type. It shows us the type of object pointed by P height. If it is 6, the object uh, is a uh, clip data. If it hex C, the object uh, uh, is a monitor. If we take away the 4 from the 6 and turn it to 2, then we force the clip data object to the menu object. Uh, so we have a type confusion uh, vulnerability. I can control the pointers in the menu object and modify other memory. It sounds good, and uh, actually I wrote a whole process, uh, whole exploit based on the te technique before. However, this is not a general solution. What if we need to modify the position zero or position three? So I started to find out whether there is a more general uh, exploit. The answer is the reference count. In each main uh, 32K objects, there are uh, like tag event, uh, tag manual, tag monitor. There is a CNAC object member at offset uh, 8. It means the reference count of the object. If some other object refer it, um, then it's a reference count 8.1. In the color, there are two functions which can be used to modify C lock object. One is HM assignment lock. It is used for increasing the reference count. The other function is HM assignment unlock. It is used for decreasing the reference count. If we call destroy window or destroy menu, 
the function mark object destroy will be involved. It will check whether the reference count is zero or not. If it is not, the object will not be destroyed. If it is zero, the object will be freed. Uh, let's have a look at another basic uh, object in Windows, menu. We can call create menu API to create our menu. At the same time, the color create our target menu structure. We can call a pend menu API to append our menu onto another one. Uh, right here, I create two menus, menu A and uh, menu B, and call append menu for four times. The data structure in the color is uh, shown right here at menu A. RG items point to your array, and uh, the C items indicate the count of the members in the array. In our case, there are four tag items, and uh, the SP submenu uh, all refer to menu B. So the reference count of menu B is four, which is right here in the signal object. Since there is no other menu pending to menu B, we could see it uh, signal uh, items is uh, zero and the uh, items points to none. If we call destroy menu to destroy menu B, we will be failed because the signal object of menu B is four. The system refused us to do so. With the help of uh, overflow and uh, R15 register, we can turn the knock object of many B to be zero. What can we do now? So we can destroy many B, uh, freeze the memory of many B. To be noticed that the SP sub menu is still pointing to many B, the freed object. After destroying menu B, we have to call NT user dev state tags immediately to set our name for our window. If the window has no name, then our memory would be allocated from desktop heap for storing the name string. What happened if the name string size is the same as menu B? The system will allocate the menu B memory for us, which we uh, just uh, destroyed. I can see the name string to be any data, so I can see the menu B's content to be any data. I can see the point of menu B to anywhere. Menu B turns to be freed memory, then turns to be a fake menu. So right now, SP sub menu points to a fake menu. What we do now is to make a simple fake menu. We set the C items to one and uh, let RG items point to our memory we controlled. In that memory, we fake our tag item structure and uh, set the SP sub menu member to our tag window with offset uh, hex 80. In normal situation, SP sub menu points to our tag menu structure. Now we force it point to our tag window structure in the middle. We regard it as our tag menu structure, which we ref to our virtual menu. What we care is the CV window extra, which is also DW menu data in the virtual menu. Now let's put them together. We can set information of our menu by calling set menu info API. There are two marks uh, which we are interested in. When we specify the mask MI menu data, we will see the DW menu data of the tag menu. When we specify the mask MI apply to sub menus, we will also set the DW menu data of the sub menu one after another. Let's look at the picture we, we built our chain before. Menu A sub menu, sub menu used to be menu B. Now it becomes a fake menu which is controlled by us. The fake menu sub menu is a virtual menu with point to your tag window structure in the middle. When we specify those two masks, we will finally set the virtual menu's DW menu data. That means we will finally set the CB window extra of window one. We could assignate the privilege to system as we said before. To be noticed that the C items of the virtual menu is zero, so the operation of setting submenus data will be stopped in virtual menu. 
Uh, the function NTGDI gate function Unicode ranges is added in Windows uh, 2000 SP2. It has been 15 years. Perhaps it's too simple, and so nobody noticed it. And uh, Microsoft didn't change the code of the function. From Windows 2000 to Windows 1, uh, uh, from Windows 2000 to Windows 10, from 32 bit to 16 4 bit, the procedure remains the same. What they do is getting the size first and then allocating memory, then getting the data all the same. So this vulnerability exists in all the windows you can see. In the exploit I mentioned before, I use the window and the menu. Those are the basic objects in windows. And as you forbid when 32K travel, I can launch the attack and get the system privilege by any user. The offices shows shown in the PowerPoint are uh, within Windows 10, 15, 11, uh, 16-4 bit. If you uh, want to attack the other windows, you only need to adjust the offset. Now let's uh, just roll them all. Uh, let's take a summary. How to explore Windows color by a tiny bit from one to zero? The answer is writing zero to target minus C lock object. So we create another use out of frame vulnerability, make our fake menu, and uh, reset the CB window extra of our target window. I use the menu object for the job. You could pick another one if the object has pointers, and uh, you can write data to the pointed address. Uh, uh, that's all, thank you for the coming. Any questions? <laughs>